Well, th- thanks everybody for uh, for joining us here again today for another fantastic panel. We are Justice Andrew with uh, Twin Cities News Talk, AM eleven thirty and one zero three five FM. You can listen to the show Monday through Friday, six until nine a.m. Or you can sit here and watch us do this fantastic constitutional uh, panel today. That's right. That's right. We are joined. We've got Doug Wardlow running for Attorney General. Round of applause for him. We've got. Pam Myra running for state auditor. Round of applause. And if anybody sees like a wild John Howe running around who's running for secretary of state, tell him that we've got a seat for him reserved right over here. We will uh, we'll ask him questions anyway. So we'll start off. We'll give you guys a, a minute to, uh, to do some sort of opening statements, introduce yourself to the crowd, uh, and talk about you know why you're running. My name is Pam Myra. I'm running for Minnesota State Auditor. I'm a certified public accountant with an active license, and I'm a former audit manager at KPMG. It's an international public accounting firm, so I'm an auditor running for auditor. I also served. That's in a- weird. <laughs> I know it is. That's like crazy? never happened in this state. No, it hasn't. It is. I know it it's yeah. bizarre. It would. I would be the first CPA, certified public accountant, to serve in this position. I served in the legislature for two terms, four years, and while doing so, I chief authored two, well, I chief authored a bunch of bills, but I chief authored two bills on government transparency that were unanimously passed in the House and signed into law by the governor. And what that taught me was very clear to see is that both Democrats and Republicans really care about government transparency and and accountability in how our tax dollars are used. So as your next Minnesota State Auditor, I would lead the office and set the tone for those financial audits and performance reviews. And it is so important, as we just uh, maybe heard a couple days ago, or $250,000 missing in Dakota County for low, low, yes, low income housing. And so it's really important that there is that that function. Sorry, that just made me chuckle. Yeah, I know. It actually is. But, you know, they put so much emphasis on affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing. And uh, and what do we find out? You know, how far could that $250,000 go towards towards helping with that? Well, of course. And and when somebody is taking $250,000 away from that very important program, that's not there for the people who really need it. And so it is a very important function of, of watching over your tax dollars. Thanks for being here today. Hello, everybody. Doug Wardler running for Attorney General. This is... Oh, thank you. Thank you, yes. Yay! <laughs> it's such an important race. I'm so excited to be running for Attorney General, and I'm so excited that there's so much attention on the Attorney General's race because it's such an important office for Minnesota. The Democrats have had this office for 48 years, so nearly half a century. The Democrats have been using the 150 or so attorneys in the Attorney General's office to push forward the Democrats' big government agenda. And there's really no way to get our state back on the path to liberty and prosperity and limited government unless we first take back the office of attorney general. And it's all about the rule of law. So the attorney general shouldn't be doing political things. The attorney general should be standing up for the rule of law, defending our constitutional rights. You know, we need to rebuild the criminal law division of the office, make sure our our prosecutors, our county attorneys have the resources that they need to do their job and get convictions. Uh, We need to keep our people safe, fight the opioid epidemic. We need to work on the human trafficking issue that is is really a scourge across Minnesota that's getting worse and worse. The Democrats haven't been taking the lead on these issues from the Attorney General's office because they've been busy playing political games. Lori Swanson has politicized the office. There was a report out not too many weeks ago, uh, and if the allegations are true, and I think they are because they're oft repeated allegations, she is requiring her staff, or at least pressuring them, to do campaign work on office time and even at the office. And that's just completely inappropriate. Now, Keith Ellison, my opponent, he wants to take that to the next level. Keith Ellison has said expressly on MSNBC that he wants to use the office to lead the resistance, as he put it, against President Trump. So that means he wants to just bring lawsuit after lawsuit against the president, gang up with other Democrat attorneys general around the country, and and just try to make policy through the AG's office, through the courts, bypassing the legislature, bypassing Congress, obstructing the president. That's completely inappropriate. Even for you know, Democrats who may not like President Trump, uh, Minnesotans do not want an attorney general who's going to be political like that. That's completely inappropriate. So I'm running to take the politics out of the office, put Minnesota first, and, and just do some of the things that the Democrats haven't been doing. Keep our people safe, you know, prosecute welfare fraud. We've all heard about the, I'm sure you all heard about the situation in the Somali community with Somali daycare centers where we have a situation where um, 
you know, daycare centers are defrauding the government of up to perhaps $100 million a year in child care subsidy payments. We have to put a stop to that. The attorney general should be prosecuting welfare fraud. So there's a lot of things that the Democrats haven't been doing while they're busy playing political games with the office, and I'm going to put a stop to that. And first off, uh, yeah, that's a good job. Um, for those that don't know, Keith Ellison, he's just the worst. He's awful. Just absolutely awful. Terrible. Um, put, putting it in, in context a bit for, for, for the question I want to ask, think about when you live in a house for a long period of time and you have to move, right? The longer you live in that house, the more difficult it is to move because the more stuff you accumulate, you get situated. You're, just, you're living in it. That position, 48 years... I mean, and, and, and again, use it in that, it in that context of how long that party has had control of that position. And you use that analogy, and you can understand why they want to hold on to it so desperately. And Drew's mentioned several times on the show, you know, what will, what will be found beneath the floorboards, you know, of that position were it to go in and change parties. For both of you... As you go and you meet potential voters, as you meet voters, do you find that they generally understand the importance of both of these positions? Or because of the nature of the positions, because they are different than what you see for other races, that they don't quite understand the importance of, of both of these positions? That is a really good question, thank you. It has been really fun campaigning, quite honestly. People get it. And going back to my experience in the House and having uh, those two bills that were unanimously passed on government transparency, it's really clearly evident to me that people care about their tax dollars. They get it. That when somebody takes over $250,000 from a low-income housing program, that it's not there for the people who really need it. It's not, you know, when money is being taken from government programs or cities or counties and not being used effectively or the way it's intended, it's not there for building roads, paying teachers, funding our government pensions, whatever that might be. And so people really get it. And as I've been going, actually, it has truly been fun. Uh, I've been going to a lot of county fairs. And recently, I went to one, and I was standing with my back up against the table and, uh, of the Republican booth. And a gentleman came up to me, and I put out my hand to shake his hand, and he willingly took my hand and shook it. And then he looked past my shoulder to see it was a GOP booth. And he said, well, I'm a strong Democrat. And I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, that's okay, you still want to vote for me. <laughs> and you know, he laughed. And then I shared with him that I'm a certified public accountant with an active license, former audit manager at KPMG, an international public accounting firm. I've got the background and experience. We talked about a couple other things. And he said he'd vote for me. And that is kind of how it's going. When people understand that I have the background, I have the experience to actually uh, look out for them. And they are very supportive. Uh, when they understand that my opponent is a junior high math teacher, they're quite honestly appalled. And they say, how can that be? Uh, her comments that she's been making at the state fair is that she's the li literally a bean counter. She doesn't know the profession enough to realize that a bean counter is a derogatory term for a bookkeeper. That's not what, <laughs> that's not an auditor. As an auditor, quite, fr fr quite frankly, we're not so concerned about counting as we're concerned about when things don't add up. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot, not to, not to go off on a tangent there, but it's, it's about prod the process more than the actual result, right, when it comes to auditing. There actually are government auditing standards, and our current state auditor has no idea what those are. And I, I, I well, well. <laughs> That would seem maybe, like maybe she understands a, a really little bit, important but part of her job. It, it seems like a really important job. But you know what happened this last spring in May? The Senate unanimously, again, when it's unanimous, that means all the Democrats bought in with the Republican bill, right? Unanimously admonished her and, and wrote a bill that she should follow a particular procedure in dealing with the counties and the cities. And it really wasn't necessary that they write that bill 
They put that through, have committee time, and unanimously vote on the Senate floor about it because that's already in government auditing standards. I commit to you that when I serve as your Minnesota State Auditor, we will follow government auditing standards. So yeah, people do understand how important the Attorney General's office is, and I think you know, the fact that Keith Ellison is, is, has uh, decided not to run for his congressional seat and is jumping into the race has brought even more attention on it, and people are learning very quickly how important the Attorney General's office is. But what people really do understand, and as I'm going around the state, and it is quite a bit of fun to go around the state and meet so many Minnesotans from all different walks of life, pretty much everyone understands that the Attorney General's office should not be a political office. We should not be playing politics with the office. It's just about enforcing the law. And that's exactly what I'm going to do when I'm an Attorney General. So we're going to tackle a number of different issues. We're going to uh, reorganize the office to make sure that we have the resources we need and the places we need to do the th things we need to do to put Minnesota first. You know, We need to rebuild the criminal law division of the office. We need to prosecute welfare fraud. We need to lift the burden of regulations off of job creators and farmers and individuals. And, you know, it shouldn't take 16 years for uh, Polymet to get a uh, copper nickel mining permit. That's, that's preposterous, and it shouldn't take over 10 years to renew a, a taconite mining permit. And that's happening because there isn't a fair process in place, and the current Attorney General doesn't care. The current Attorney General is busy playing politics, and I can guarantee you that Keith Ellison, he's just going to play politics and take it to the next level, and that's going to be bad for Minnesota. So people do understand that the office is currently being abused, and people do understand, uh, in, they innately seem to understand, that you don't want an Attorney General, the top lawyer in the state, and your top law enforcement official, you don't want that person playing politics, because that leads down a very, very bad path. You don't want political prosecutions. That's a terrible idea. So this, uh, this office is essentially, it's, it's a partisan office in that you have a Republican or a Democrat in the office, but it's essentially a non-political job, and I'm running to take the politics out of the office, and people get that. Both of these offices, especially the Attorney General, but the Auditor as well, they've both been under DFO control for some time. I mean, you, you mentioned 48 years. I think we're going on, what, 12 years of DFO control of the Auditor's office. and. In, in that time, both offices have been, there's, there, there have been accusations, obviously the Lori Swanson ones were, were, were big news, but there's been accusations of the occupants of these offices not doing the job they're supposed to do, using them more as political platforms. You know, there's been sort of this pattern with DFL of you go to auditor or attorney general or secretary of state, and then you run for governor or congress or whatever from, from there. They're kind of used as stepping stones. So with that, being said, there's probably a lot of services that Minnesotans have been missing out on while these offices have been used for more political purposes. What would you like your average Minnesotan to understand what they've potentially been missing by not having people in these offices who intend to use them to do the job they're supposed to do? Okay. Well, there are so many things that Minnesotans are missing out on. First of all, the criminal law division, Lori Swanson and Mike Ash before her, and before I comment on that just very briefly, you know, you're right. I think every Democrat attorney general for the last many decades has run for governor. Uh, never successfully, though. It's not, it's not a good plan to become AG and then run for governor, apparently, because it never works. Lori Swanson didn't work for her. Mike Hatch didn't work for him. Warren Spanis didn't work for him. Doug Head was the last Republican attorney general back in 1966, selected, served through 1970. He ran for governor as well and lost to Wendell Anderson. So the Doug Wardlow for governor campaign is probably on hiatus for a little while. Yeah, I want to be attorney general and focus on that. And guess what? I'm a serious attorney, and I demonstrate the fact that I'm a serious attorney by holding an active Minnesota law license which is something that Keith Ellison does not have. But be that as it may, there are a lot of different things the Attorney General's office should be providing the citizens of Minnesota that they aren't getting right now, and the Criminal Law Division is, is the biggest example of that. You know, the Criminal Law Division used to be very robust, even under Skip Humphrey. Mike Hatch and Lori Swanson have eviscerated the office. There aren't many attorneys in it. it. The Criminal Law Division should be coordinating with law enforcement, backing up law enforcement, making sure that we have strategies in place to deal with uh, the opioid epidemic, to help enforce our immigration laws, coordinating with federal authorities, to fight human trafficking, backing up our county attorneys, making sure that they have the resources that they need to actually prosecute crimes. You know, greater Minnesota, it's a significant problem. You know, in 2012, there was a, a, mur a very complicated murder case up in Morrison County. And the county attorney there didn't know how to handle it. So as per procedure, the county attorney called up Lori Swanson's office and asked her to come in and take over the case. But Lori Swanson said no. Didn't send a single attorney up there, didn't provide any support, not even, not even some telephone support. She just said, you're on your own. And so what ended up happening was the Washington County attorney, Pete Orput, had to take time out of his schedule, and he was able to go up there and prosecute the case. 
But the fact that that should have never happened. I mean, Washington County, is, it's a busy county. He's got a lot of things going on there. And that stretches the resources of, of the county attorneys thin. And it ultimately leads to a Minnesota that's less safe. And we can't have that. So rebuilding the criminal law division and making sure that communities are safe is, is one of the biggest things that folks are missing out on uh, with the Democrats in charge of the office. The other thing, of course, is, is welfare fraud. It, it's not being prosecuted. And the attorney general is the only statewide official that has the authority to actually prosecute welfare fraud and uh, bring civil lawsuits to recover defrauded funds on behalf of the state, and I'll do both of those things. Thank you. This is really a good question. I have been asked to run for state auditor over and over and over and over again. And back in 2009, I was thinking about getting into politics, so I asked my dear father, what do you think, Dad? And he said, well, if you get into politics, run for an office where you can really make a difference. Run for an office that you really care about the issues. And then he paused and said, don't run for state auditor. <laughs> so, you know, my dear father uh, passed away. And, and uh, I, by the way, I, I did run for house and won twice. And um, I was, I've been asked in these following years over and over again, and people say, well, why, what took you so long to get into the race? Well, this last fall, I was asked a number of times again, and I said to my dear husband, I said, honey, you know, should I take a look at this? And he said, yeah, you know, you'd really be, you'd be really good. So I went and I read Minnesota statute. And as I was sitting there in my office reading statutes, about 25 pages on the state auditor, I actually started to shake. It wasn't because it was a cold fall day. It wasn't because I was afraid. It was because I was angry. I was angry. I was angry because uh, not as a potential candidate or a certified public accountant, but I was angry because I'm a taxpayer in Minnesota. And looking at the statute, it, I realized that a lot of the statute is outdated. Uh, many of the sections go back to the 90s and the 80s, and they haven't kept up with the profession of auditing. And there's some real issues there, particularly the issue of being independent. And uh, there was a huge case out in Dixon, Illinois, where a city treasurer embezzled $53 million. And what was the issue? Is independence of the auditing firm. And so, yes. $53 million, it represented over $3,000 for every single person who lived in that community. Little babies, retired people, people who weren't working, people who were working for the state, for the uh, city, you know, everybody was impacted by that. And so that's why I jumped into this race. And yes, the, the Office of State Auditor has been used for political purposes. And where Attorney General hasn't been very successful, many people have gone from State Auditor to Governor, but I am really, I want to buckle down and really improve the Office of State Auditor. And it is my commitment that it would be, um, we would follow government auditing standards. We would update the statute for those government auditing standards. Uh, those government auditing standards were updated in 2011, and uh, those, those should be Im improved. And I'm a certified public accountant. That P in the middle stands for public. Stands for public. It doesn't stand for partisan. It doesn't stand for party. It doesn't stand for um, political issues or whatever. It stands for public. And as, as a CPA, I've taken an oath of the profession to serve the public interest, and that is what I'm going to do. And so one of the important things as a certified public accountant is to be independent, like I mentioned before, and that's also not to, to be partisan, it's not to be biased, it's not to put forth our own uh, opinions, but to keep the public interest foremost in mind. It's crazy when you think that both of you can simply go out and say, if somebody asks you, like, well, you know, what are you going to do in the, in the position? Like, you have a legitimate argument to say, well, I'm actually going to, like, do the job yes. and, and do the job appropriately. I mean, that's, that's insane. D to that, like, on a personal note, when you, when you look ahead at holding the position, we'll get into, we'll, we'll hop into the, into the uh, you know, into the future machine, the time machine, and you've both won... When you think about that, for each of you, what's one aspect of the job or the aspect of the job that 
genuinely gets you excited, that you most look forward to doing in each position? What well, really gets me excited, and really gets me excited is that taxpayers would be protected. That we wouldn't have these situations that just came out two days ago where $250,000 of taxpayer money that should be used for low-income housing program has been taken by somebody who's moved to Florida now. Uh, you know, we pay a lot of taxes here, and we want to see that those taxes are used effectively and for the intended purpose. And that really gets me excited, that we would be able to transform that office. And quite honestly, it, it took me a little while to realize, hey, I chief authored those two bills in the House of Representatives that were unanimously passed because the public wanted to know how their tax dollars were being used. And this just dovetails right into it. As state auditor, I am going to work very diligently to update that, uh, the, the statute that governs that office and improve it. Even though they wouldn't listen to me, if they didn't listen to me, even with the statute that we have right now, there is plenty there of, uh, uh, that empowers me to run that office according to generally accepted auditing or government auditing standards. And so I am, as a taxpayer, I'm thrilled with the idea of my serving in that position and setting the tone for the people of Minnesota. So there are a lot of things that, that get me excited about thinking about, you know, going into the Attorney General's office, but I think underlying all of them is really just the rule of law. I'm excited about standing up for the rule of law. The idea that there is one law for everyone. You know, law is the great equalizer in America, regardless of whether you're rich or you're poor, high status, low status, whatever your, your trade, occupation, whatever it is, race, es race, ethnicity, everyone is the same under the law. Everyone's absolutely the same under the law, and we have lost that in America to a certain extent, and that's because too, too often politicians are playing politics with the offices that they hold, whether it's in Congress or you know, the legislature or in the Office of Attorney General, and that's exactly what's happening in the Office of Attorney General. The Democrats having held that for nearly half a century, you know, like you were saying, that, that's just too long. When we get in there, I think we're going to be finding things that are a little bit, well, exactly, there should perhaps be term limits. I think term limits are a great idea. I think we could all agree that like, maybe a 40-year term limit is, is enough for one party. <laughs> Uh, four decades or so. That, that's plenty of time. Uh, and it, it's detrimental to the rule of law to have one party in such an important, important office for, for such a long time because power corrupts as time passes and, and, and power accumulates. And, and that's really not a good thing. So standing up for the rule of law is, it gets me very excited. And one aspect of that is going to be cleaning out corruption and going after corrupt entities, going after corrupt folks, uh, firing a bunch of corrupt people, that kind of thing, moving deck chairs around a little bit, and making sure things are in place so that we can move forward uh, and actually put our state back on the path to liberty and prosperity, uh, doing a top to bottom review of the office. That's very exciting because this is an office that should be working for the people of Minnesota, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. We've touched on it a little bit off and on in a lot of these questions and answers, but it is, it's, it's, it's a little odd that these two technical offices that require a certain amount of skills are up for partisan elections, where anybody can run for these offices, regardless if they have any qualifications or not. You know, in increasingly sort of partisan times, how do you campaign and convince voters who may be just sort of party line voters and already might have a predisposition in favor or against you because you're Republicans, how do you convince voters to fill out the bubble next to your name for a job that is rather technical in nature? Well, for Attorney General, I think it's pretty easy. I, I, I tell people that I'm a serious attorney, and I am. You know, I'm a constitutional lawyer. I've been fighting for free speech and religious freedom in, in cases all across the country for the last several years. I have done international trade litigation, working under the man who is now Donald Trump's U.S. trade representative, fighting uh, unfairly dumped and subsidized imports of steel from China and some other countries. I've done a lot of different things. And so being a serious attorney, I can, people trust me to step into that job and, then, and do the serious work of the Office of Attorney General. And like I said before, people in Minnesota understand, people in Minnesota understand that the Attorney General's office should not be political. So it's a pretty simple case to make. And then when I'm running against Keith Ellison, makes it all, all the more easy because he is about as you know, political as you can get. And he's about as far left as you can get. And he's also- he's he, not a serious attorney. He's not a serious attorney. No. He has not maintained his law license and active status for the last attorney. six years, right? And uh, you know he's got associations with Louis Farrakhan. He has 
you know, where he doesn't believe in borders. He wore a, a T-shirt in the May Day Parade that says, I don't believe in borders in Spanish on it. And he recently said that borders create an injustice, uh, which is a ridiculous thing to say when you're trying to be the state's top law enforcement official. So he's not about, about you know, getting in there and doing the serious work of the Attorney General. He's about playing politics, and it's a nice contrast for the voters to see, and it makes it easy to make the case that, hey, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do the serious work of the office. We don't want politics in that office. I'm trying to do something really unique, and that is uh, run for this office as a certified public accountant. I don't know how many of you know, but CPAs have a huge amount of trust. People trust their CPAs. It is a highly regarded profession. I mean, it's right at the top of all professions. Right, well, maybe the top three, three, yeah, three or four. Well, I don't know where talk show host, but... but way up here, way, way, way up here. <laughs> like, like over there. Politicians are way at the bottom, way at the bottom, and I'm trying to mesh that. CPA and politician kind of thing. But you know when I talk to people and share with them my credentials and uh, my experience that I had in the legislature, they are, they seem thrilled. They almost every time, almost, it, thank you for running. Thank you for being willing to serve the public. And so the, my big challenge is getting that message out, for people to understand that I am a certified public accountant, that I have, I have an active license, I have experience serving uh, as an audit manager, and that I have served in the legislature and had these, uh, unanimous, these unanimous bills. And so I think people unanimously want somebody that will advocate for them, and they recognize that a CPA is going to do that. Based on the conversations that you've had in talking with potential voters, what is it both of you guys need? What, do the peop what can the people hear? What can you tell them that they can say to other people to help you guys based off the responses that you've been, you've been getting? And, and I guess what, what I'm kind of driving at is, you know, how much time do you find yourself through no effort on your side? How much do you find yourself, uh, you know, comparing your, you to the other opponent? And how much do you find yourself just talking about what you want to do? You know, everybody needs help. What do you guys need? What have you discovered on the campaign trail? I think I'm an easy sell for this office. And I, you know, I had this one lady, she, um, she wasn't gonna vote for me a number of years ago. I got into the legislature, she, she then she, okay, I'm gonna tell you the truth. She's my aunt. <laughs> My aunt, said, my aunt used to live in my house district, and I, I called her up and I said, Auntie, I'm, I'm, I'm running for state legislature, and she says, Pammy, I love you, but I'm not voting for you. I then listened to her for about 30 minutes, and, and you know, she, the only thing I could say was, well, Auntie Ruth, they, oh, I said her name too, no, she'll forgive me. <laughs> she, she does love me. But anyway, she said, I, the only thing I could think of is, Auntie Ruth, you are so loyal. I just really appreciate your loyalty. I mean, she's being really loyal. So anyway, a, a number of months went past. I got in the legislature, and she totally turned around. She realized that I was really caring about the people of my house district. I was doing a really good job. And then she said, Pammy, can I have some of those papers to hand out all to my all my neighbors. Now this is a lady in her 80s. And then most recently we were at a funeral together and she said, Pammy, can I, now she's in her 90s. Pammy, can I have some of your papers to give to all the ladies and all the men in the nursing home? Because I want every single one of them to vote for you. And you know, she, she took a whole wad of, of my literature and I got a feeling she's gonna have every single person in that nursing home voting for me. Because she, she recognizes that I have the credentials, the background, the experience to do a really good job for them. What do I need? I need people like Auntie Ruth out there carrying my literature, particularly to to those swing districts, those areas where they, you know, they maybe voted for Hillary Clinton and then down the line voted for Republicans or vice versa. That's where the real action is. And so I need people being ambassadors on behalf of Pam Myra for Auditor. I also need people to visit my website. It's real simple, www 
www.pamforauditor.com. That's pamforauditor.com. Visit my website. I have a secure website. And please donate generously. I really need your, your funds to be able to uh, carry on the campaign. And then follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Pam for Auditor. That's at Pam for Auditor. And uh, please get out and vote November 6th. Appreciate it. Thanks. So, of course, visit my website, DougWardlowAG.com. You can sign up to volunteer there. You can, you can make a financial contribution. That's very important. Uh, we, we need to get the message out. But really what, you know, so in 2006, Lori Swanson was Solicitor General, so just the second in charge, basically, uh, at the Attorney General's office, and she was on her way into being Attorney General uh, under Mike Hatch. And she, the, the Attorney General's office then sued Capital One for consumer fraud, alleging consumer fraud. And they came to a settlement agreement. And in that settlement agreement that was signed by Lori Swanson, it directed nearly $250,000 of settlement funds from Capital One directly to Acorn. And you might all recall in 2006 that Acorn was doing some political things. And they weren't exactly nonpartisan. That's what's going on in our Attorney General's office. It has become the heart of the DFL political machine. It is corrupt. It, we need to change the way that office operates. We need to take it back into Republican hands. We need to take the politics out of the office. This is very important. We cannot turn the state red permanently unless we enforce our election laws, right? If we don't enforce our election laws, if we don't send the message that if you cast an illegal, illegal ballot knowingly and intentionally in this state, you're going to go to jail. That's what the message I'm going to send when I'm Attorney General. But if we don't do that, this state's not going to be red. This state is not going to have fair elections. This state is going to continue to have corruption in its government. And, we, and there's quite a bit of corruption in the Minnesota government, uh, not just in the Attorney General's office. And we need to clean all that up. So what I'm asking all of you to do is to get the word out. To get the word out, to tell all of your neighbors and friends and relatives, everybody all over Minnesota, every corner of the state, just how important this election is. We have a choice. The choice is between the rule of law and the Constitution, and then Keith Ellison and open borders and socialism, Louis Farrakhan. We don't want that. Antifa. We don't want that. Antifa. I mean, that's right. You cannot get more extreme than Keith Ellison. So we need to get the word out just how important this election is, how important the race for attorney general is, and how incredibly fantastic it will be when we take back this office for the first time in nearly half a century and finally get this state back on the path to liberty and limited government and prosperity. And, and, and what's amazing about that is, is Keith Ellison, he doesn't even try to hide it. He wears that extremism like a badge, like a badge of honor. I mean, it's 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 frightening. I mean, I, and I'm not I'm not I'm not joking. It is. It's true. It's right. truly frightening. It is. You both have uh, benefited uh, greatly from a lot of outside attention on what normally would be kind of dull, boring races that don't get a lot of attention. Obviously, Doug Wardlow with uh, you know the the attention paid to Lori Swanson's using the office and making the staffers work for her political gain and political advantage, and then Keith Ellison entering the race. Uh, the National Republican Attorney General's Association heard the other day has actually stepped in, and they're setting up an office uh, here in Minnesota and, uh, and are going to be supporting your race. So that is fantastic news. Round of applause. That is fantastic news. I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's ever happened, at least not ever since I've been paying attention. Not in the last 50 years. No. In the last 50 years. Uh, but Pam Myra, for the auditor's race, um, you know, you, you benefited uh, from some attention that, that the auditor's office has gotten recently with the law that was passed uh, that allowed counties to opt out of using the state auditor and go to private firms. And then Rebecca Otto sued the state... Uh, wasted a ton of taxpayer money suing the state, trying to block that law that Governor Dayton signed uh, to coming into effect. Lori Swanson was nowhere to be found defending that lawsuit, defending the state against that lawsuit. Uh, I want to talk. I want you to talk a little bit about that law, about what it means, why you think it was passed, and why you think that counties are getting a better deal going outside of the state to get their, you know, required audits done than they would be for, you know, going to an office that is not required to make any sort of profit. I don't understand how the state auditor's office isn't able to compete with private sector firms when it comes to providing audits for counties when they're under no pressure from shareholders or anybody else to make a profit. Love your question. Thank you. Just to set the table a little. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Just to set the table a little bit, for some of you who haven't been following it, back in 2015, the Republican House, the Democrat Senate, and a Democrat governor passed a bill. And what that bill allowed is for counties to be able to decide if they want to have their financial audit done by the state auditor or to go to a private public accounting firm. They would have their choice. Our current state auditor took it to three levels of uh, cases, and it, this last April, it was decided by the Minnesota Supreme Court that the uh, 2015 law passed again by a Republican House, a Democrat Senate, and it was signed by a Democrat governor, uh, was constitutional. And I don't recall, but you know, I think it might have been. But one of the one of the really important things also that happened in there, it, the the Minnesota Supreme Court affirmed the responsibility of the state auditor to be overseeing those uh, public accounting firms, and that's that is really important. What they were doing in this law was not radical, not at all. It was allowing counties the same flexibility, the same choices that cities have had for a long time. Cities have been able to pick if they want to have a private uh, accounting firm do their uh, financial audit for a long time. This was just giving counties that, that same choice, that same flexibility. I would not want to revisit that. I thought it was great law. I served in the legislature from the beginning of 2011 through the beginning of 2015, so I wasn't in the legislature, but if I had been, I would have voted for it. And this is why, one, it was giving counties the same choices that cities have had a long time, but it also increases independence. I talked about independence earlier. It would give um, better audits and it also reaffirmed the importance of the state auditor doing those quality assurance reviews of those uh, accounting firms. So I, I see it as a win-win. I'm very pleased. Why do you think um, counties are able to get a better deal though, like going to a private firm? Well, it's I mean, th th does that not speak to some degree of inefficiency or incompetence in Rebecca Otto's uh, you know, office that she apparently can't do a better job at a, at a better price than a private company firm when she's under no profit uh, pressure whatsoever? Well, that's a real reasonable conclusion, Assumption. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you open it up like that, when you, you, it's not a monopoly, you have competition. And I really believe that when you have competition, you have greater choices, and you're going to have a better product for the people of Minnesota. Yeah. Doug, in terms of priorities, once you take the position, um, talk about some things that you'd like to immediately get to work on, or or look into. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of house cleaning involved. Maybe uh, you know, finding new staff. Uh, but, <laughs> but I'm, cu I'm I'm curious in terms of priorities. What what are some things going? You know what? Once I get this job, I want to look at this. I want to look at this. This is what I need to start start focusing on. Absolutely, and, and you know, there are a number of very good attorneys in the attorney general's office, and 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 they'll be able to keep their jobs. We're just going to go through and make sure that. We only have attorneys that believe in the rule of law and are extremely good attorneys and are not going to be political. And if they're all those things, then they're, they're good to go. But I have a feeling there are a lot of folks in there that aren't going to meet those um, qualifications. Now, that being said, things to do on day one or in the first you know, several weeks at least, there are so many different priorities. This office has been <clears throat> in the hands of the Democrats for so long. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. But we need to, first of all, rebuild the criminal law division of the office. We need to prosecute welfare fraud. We're going to have to start actually helping um, local and state law enforcement and also DHS investigate uh, cases of welfare fraud, then line those cases up for prosecution. So that's one thing we're going to have to work on. Election integrity is a big thing that we're going to have to work on starting on day one. There are just a number of different things. Then, of course, the regulatory state, that's one of the biggest parts of the job, is just going to be reining in the bureaucracies in the executive branch of government that so often, you know, the MPCCA, MPCA, the DNR, all these different agencies, we have 102 different agencies and boards and commissions in our state. You know, they're staffed by unelected bureaucrats, and, and far too often they go beyond their statutory mandate. They're doing things that are illegal. They're doing things that are sort of ad hoc. They're basically making the law and making, making rules up as they go and making life difficult for businesses and for farmers and for individuals. The buffer law, the way that's being applied, is one example. That's unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional taking of private property without just compensation. 
So we need to deal with all those different things. A lot of the jobs are going to be reining in those bureaucracies. And, you know, being a lawyer, a lot of times you have to counsel your clients and tell them things that they don't want to hear. So agencies are the client of the attorney general. I'm going to be counseling them to back off when they're doing things that are illegal, back off when they're doing things that are unconstitutional, and we're going to have to sort some things out. I love it. She's all fired up. I love it. So you guys, preach it. That's right. All the rest of my questions were for John Howe. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't have. No, I got one more. <laughs> uh, serving as John Howe's understudy today will be John Justice. Um, one more question. We've touched upon sort of the the oddness of having these office be partisanly elected. You know, when they're very technical. Um, in, in an ideal world, do you think Minnesotans would be better served if these offices were perhaps appointed? By say a governor, you know, going going forward, rather than the, question the answer to that them. is no. <laughs> the question is for them. I'm just asking. That was for, that was for John Howe. He would have said yes. I know John Howe would say no, and. Um, I also say no. It's really important to have an independent attorney general's office. Uh, the framers of the Minnesota Constitution designed it that way so it can be an additional check on government. It's in the executive branch of the government, but it's really there to defend the rule of law. If it's just appointed by the governor, you don't have that additional check, and it actually becomes more political. It becomes just tied to the governor. It becomes more political. So it's important to have it, elect, have it be accountable to the people of Minnesota uh, and, because that's who is ultimately, you know, that, that's where the responsibility should flow and the accountability should flow to the people. That's who the attorney general works for, not for the governor. Totally agree. I totally agree. You know, there's been a lot of people who've said, get rid of the state auditor's office. And I so disagree with that. And it's not just because I'm running for it. <laughs> yeah, you bet. No, if it were turned over to the governor, it would be kind of just like another Met Council situation. It would be so uh, partisan. And some people have said, well, you know, we've got a legislative auditor. You know, why don't we just turn it all over to the legislative auditor? Well, listen to the name, the title, legislative auditor. The legislative auditor is at the direction of the legislature, you know? And so if one party is in control, they can actually weaponize it, you know? And we need, we need a state auditor who is accountable to us as taxpayers. We vote them in, not that the legislature would be deciding that and, and would yeah, identifying or the, setting the direction. Those were the right answers. See, I asked the question. <laughs> Y'all yelled at me for asking me that. That's why people just need to chill out. Uh, we are about out of time. I want to thank you guys. Uh, do a quick closing statement. Give out your website, contact info again. Any, uh, any, uh, any please calls to action uh, for our audience to help you out. Again, I'm Pam Myra, and I'm running for Minnesota State Auditor. I would be the first CPA certified public accountant serving in that role, and it would be my thank you. My foremost goal is to uh, audit those, do those audits, and, and serve the public according to generally accepted government auditing standards. My website is. Pam Myra for or Pam for auditor.com, Pam for auditor.com, and I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Pam for Auditor. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you so much for taking the time to have this forum. This is fantastic. Thanks everybody here for attending. So again, Doug Wardlow running for Attorney General. The website is DougWardlowAG.com. You know, like I said before, we have a big choice in this election. The, the, the choice in this election is between the people and between bigger government. The choice in this election is between the Constitution and the rule of law versus an Attorney General's office that's entirely political and is going to be used if Keith Ellison were to win, which he's not. But if he, he, what he wants to do is to fight President Trump every step of the way, obstruct, 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 and really use the Office of Attorney General to transform our state uh, by bypassing the legislature and bypassing Congress. That's completely inappropriate. So let's take the politics out of this office. Let's stand up for the rule of law and the Constitution. Really appreciate your support. God bless. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming out and checking out the panel. A couple of notes. Tomorrow, we're going to be back here, same time, 2 o'clock, uh, to talk to your next governor, Jeff Johnson. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, also, on a programming note, we are Justice and Drew, Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, 103. And that's Sam. FM. That is Sam, our producer. Our Sam. producer. Yeah. I had to battle some crowds to get here, so it was a little late. <laughs>
Thank you. Next week, the three of us are actually going to be in Washington, D.C. for uh, from uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday uh, doing yeah, the show live. The Wednesday through Friday show. Wednesday be... through Friday. And we've got a list growing of uh, fantastic interviews from people in D.C. So Including, be sure you check uh, out the show. Representative Jason Lewis, Representative Tom Emmer will be visiting the show uh, in person yeah. uh, while we're there. Katie Pavlich um, from Fox News should be joining us live. We're also looking to get the current, well, the fo a former head and the current head of uh, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement on with us live. And that's just a, a, a small sampling of who we're planning on talking to uh, next week. So be sure you check the, uh, check the show out. And thanks, everybody, for coming out today. Thank you all.